Augusta. Titus chapter number one. I think we we have an element that's missing today, and it's called character. Character. Titus one verse ten. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not, for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Cretans are alway liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. Now watch this. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. Father, bless this book. Bless your word. The word's perfect. The seed being sown tonight is absolute. And Father, I pray for the messenger that you'd give me unction now. In Jesus' name, amen. Character. In, uh, if you live long enough in this world, you'll meet a lot of people. you meet a lot of people. And uh, you'll meet people that you know for a long time. And when you know them for a long time, you kind of get to know them. And you'll discover that a lot of religious people, religious people that go to the church house, have a sorry character. You'll learn that. You'll find out that there are people who come to the church house, you can't trust them. You couldn't trust them as far as you could throw them. You can't believe them. They'll lie to you. And uh, you say, good night, preacher. You talking, I'm talking about church people. And uh, they'll lie to you. They'll turn on you. They'll try, to, they'll try to hurt you, stab you in the back. And they'll try, to, they'll try to cause other people to come against you. And everything imaginable, you're going to find that in the church. So don't be naive and think that just because they're coming to the church house with you where you're coming, that these are good, sweet Christian saints. Hope they are, but a lot of times they're not. I want to talk about some things tonight that bear directly on your character. Number one is your word. We can believe God. His word is forever settled. If he speaks, it's so, whether I believe it or not. God's word is all powerful. Amen. He's the creator. And he speaks and brings universes into existence. And he is the one you can trust. You can trust God. And he will not lie to you. He'll tell you the truth. It's up to us to discern the truth and compare uh, deception and we live in a time of deception folks we've got people telling people already what the mark of the beast is they're telling people this now folks you're you're sticking your neck out further than you could ever imagine when you tell somebody you know what that mark is right now because the fact of the matter is they may reject what you think the mark is now and then later on take the mark thinking they have rejected the mark are you following me be very careful and uh from the first place I believe per firmly tonight the mark of the beast is for tribulation saints. It's for tribulation people. It's for those people of Jacob's trouble, seven years. We're going to be gone. But we do, need the we do need to lay the groundwork for people to prepare them for those that are going to be here. Because there's going to be a lot of people here. They're going to be here in the tribulation. Are you a liar? Is your word any good? When you tell someone you're going to do something, do you do it? Your word is your bond. Your word is, is probably of all the things that you are. It's a mark, true mark of your character. You should, you should find it very difficult to lie. <laughs> Amen. Because when you get into that, you've grieved the Holy Ghost. God won't put up with a liar. And uh, I'm afraid that we have a lot of that. Do you keep your promises? When you tell somebody you're going to do something, do you do it? You keep your promise. That promise, your, your promise is a mark of your character, a true mark. When you tell somebody you're going to do something, do it. Do what you say you're going to do. You've heard it said many times there was a time in this country when nobody signed a contract. All they did was give each other the word and shake hands. And their word was their bond. That was their reputation. That was their acceptance in the community. And if people knew that you kept your word, then you were part of the community. If they knew you were a liar and a deceiver, then you were not. You were ostracized. I'm afraid it's not like that anymore. But the truth of the matter is, you should... Keep your promises. Number two is your responsibility. We're responsible. We don't live by, to our, of ourselves and to ourselves. We live for others. 
The most miserable man in the world is a man who thinks about nothing but himself. That is one miserable, miserable, miserable soul. We have responsibilities. Do you accept responsibility for your actions? I don't care if anybody stabs you in the back. It doesn't matter if you've been run over. It doesn't matter if you've been talked about like a dog or whatever. Still, do you accept responsibility for your actions? You have to. If you don't accept responsibility for your, action, for your actions, you're never going to grow and you're never going to have a relationship with the Lord. Mount to Hill of Beans. You've got to accept responsibility for your actions. That's very, very important. You accept the responsibility for others. What's that mean? Your children, your wife, your home, your family, the people that depend upon you. Starting at the bottom, the children, they're vulnerable. We live in a great high-tech country, don't we? It's terrible, though, what they do to children in this nation. It's awful. Here in, here in, here in, in East Tennessee, we support a number of ministries that feed children, that take care of children. This church supports 33 missionaries. A lot of times you don't know that, but they do. We support a lot of missionaries out here on the foreign field. And uh, I believe it's necessary to do that. The church should be a place that supports the missions, the mission program. And uh, they feed kids. They feed them. You say, well, I want to see them saved. Yes, but it's hard to preach to them on an empty stomach. You give them, a, you give them something to eat and say, the Lord Jesus gave you this, and they might want to listen to you. Amen. Amen. Some kids in this town... They say that the only thing they have to eat is what they get when they go to school. I've had people tell me that. I've had teachers tell me that. They say these little children, they look forward to their meals because that's all they get. That's all they get. There was one little girl that was raped and beaten to death about 20, 25 years ago in this town. And they just recently executed her murderer. And the, I won't call it a home, but the house that she lived in, she was hungry. And she went into that house and let them know she was hungry. And they pointed over to a can of cold beans or something and opened it and threw it at her and said, here, eat this. And that was it. That was it. No meal, no warm meal, no love, no compassion, none of that to be found. Some kids, that's all they've ever known. It's hard for these children not to get hard, not to get cynical, not to get skeptical. It's awful hard because a child responds to love greater than anything. And that's what they're looking for. Because a child is looking for security. And if they see real love coming from someone, that's security. That's exactly what God has bred into them. So your responsibility, do you accept responsibility? I hope you do. I hope you do. I hope you do. I remember when I was, hadn't been here long, hadn't been here too long, some guy turned into a swami. He was a super spiritual Christian. Let me tell you what my experience has been with super spiritual Christians. They go off the deep end. You know what he did? He left his wife and his children, and he went out somewhere and had him ministering for God. And his wife and his children, nobody was paying the bills. His kids couldn't eat. God didn't tell him to do that. Okay? I've seen everything under the sun. Super spiritual Christians. I'm just an old dog that got saved. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> and then the third thing that will mark your character is what you fear. And you're seeing it right now. They're assaulting the First Amendment. And I've told you before that if you lose the First Amendment in this country, the rest of them doesn't matter. Because once you lose your First Amendment, they'll control you like a pack of dogs. They'll march you around and they'll herd you and they'll tell you when to go to bed and when to get up. And they'll put whoever they want to in power over you. And you'll have to hold it within yourself. And you talk about frustration. The First Amendment is a wonderful thing. I think uh, of all the things that the Founding Fathers gave us in this country that First Amendment to the Constitution. The freedom of the press, they scream loud and long about that because that's theirs. But part of that is the freedom of speech. And we need the freedom of speech. One of the great uh, assets, one of the great things about the freedom of speech is the fact that a preacher can get up like I am tonight and I can talk to you about these things. You can't do that in China. You can't do that in Russia. You can't do that in, in, in communist Cuba. You can't do that a lot of places in this world. You get up and say something like that, they'll haul you off to jail and lock you up. They don't know what freedom of speech is. Free, the freedom of speech is a true freedom. So who do you fear? Well, we have fascists running this country now. They're in the streets. They're burning houses down. They're raping. They're looting. And, they're, and, they're, and, they're, and, they're, and, and if you don't agree with them, they'll intimidate you. They'll meet at your house. 
They're, they are a despicable show of fascism in this country, yet they say they're anti-fascist, Antifa. And what are they doing? They're trying to shut down freedom of speech. Don't let them do it, folks. Don't let them do it. Don't let them do it. And then not only will your word, your responsibility, and who you fear mark your character, you should fear God and God alone. God and God alone. I fear God. Because I know that he could have whacked me into oblivion a long time ago and been justified in doing it. God could have sent me to hell and, and, and washed his hands of me and I would have had no recourse and I deserved it and worked hard to get there. I was first in line. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Amen. Folks, fear God and him alone. The fear of man bringeth a snare. And then, not only his word is a mark of your character, your responsibility is a mark of your character, who you fear is a mark of a character, but this one here is the kind of thing that really gets deep inside what you're thankful for. We live in a generation that's unthankful. We live in a time when people feel uh, entitled. You know, they're not thankful for the sweat, blood, sweat, and tears that have gone to get us where we are. Most of, the, most of these, they don't even know what D-Day is. They don't know what the beaches of Normandy is about. They don't have any idea what that is. When these men got off of those landing crafts and they went right into the face of machine guns, knowing that, knowing that imminent death was for many of them, they died right there on the beaches. What were they fighting for? They were fighting for a principle, a country, an ideology. That's what America is. It's an ideology. It's a way of thinking. It's a way of life. It's a way of life that's different from anything else on this earth. This is why men and women still come to America. They come here because it's different. Some of them come because of the prosperity. That's fine. But some of them come for the freedoms. Freedoms mean more to them than anything. And, you know, I talking to some people the other day. They came over here from Kentucky. I said, did you have to show your papers when you came out of Kentucky and Tennessee? <laughs> Any border guards? That's the way it is in a lot of places in Europe, especially Eastern Europe. You got to show your papers. That's what the Nazis implemented in Germany. In other words, they control every move you make. And we've got the technology today to do that. They can spy on you. And as some people are warning now that some of this stuff they're going to pump into your veins, that it could affect your DNA. All kinds of weird stuff coming down the pike. It's a sad thing. It's a very sad thing. But what you're thankful for? All right, number one, some aren't thankful for anything. They're entitled. I worked hard. Yeah, but you breathed while you worked hard. <laughs> you were breathing. Who do you think gave you your breath? Your boss? <laughs> you got up this morning. That's the gift of God. But you know how you can slop the hogs. I remember when I was a kid. Suey, suey, they slop the hogs. Hogs come out and they say that a hog... Well, they'll eat good food if you feed them good food. This is what I've heard now. I'm not a hog farmer. I don't know. All I'm, you know, I'm like Will Rogers. All I know is what I read in the paper. But here, the, the hogs will eat good food. But they say that once you start slopping hogs, you pour it into the trough. And they get used to it. They don't want anything else but slop. Isn't that something? That's all the hog wants is slop. Isn't that amazing? How it affects your diet? What are you eating? <laughs> Are you still eating good food or you got your head in the trough slopping with the hogs? <laughs> you get your head down there and start to <laughs> go after the go after the go after the slop. Are you thankful at all? You know, I'm gonna tell you something. How do you know what a man is thankful for? You just see what he values. That's what he's thankful for. You see a man that hangs around his, camp, his family and his children. He's thankful for his family. That's where he puts his value. That's where he puts it. You see, he's thankful for those children. You ever have a thinking spell? I have a thinking spell every once in a while. And I just go plumb off the deep end. I start thanking the Lord, and I'll thank the Lord for an hour. And I, everywhere I go, I'm thanking the Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. People hear me and think I'm crazy. That preacher's crazy. No, I'm happy, amen. Thank God. I mean, think about where you came from. Think about what he's done for you. Think about where you could be. 
Just think about these things. You could have been born in some hell hole somewhere in this world, never had an opportunity, never had anything in your life, lived, a, lived 20 or 30 years, died by some disease, kicked on and a lot of times die and throw your body over the side of the road and the buzzards pick it. But no, you were born in America. You ought to thank that. Thank the Lord. I'm born in America. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. And thank the Lord for coming to me that day and, convict, and convicting me and saving my soul. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. I've been saved since 1973 and I'm not over it yet. Amen. I never will get over it. I never will get over it because he changed me. I've known people in the church, you know, when you be around people a long enough time, I've known people in the church who get all worked up. I mean, they're, they get all worked up and they're hooping and hollering and they're talking out loud in the church and they're carrying on and they may even get up and start preaching. And then all of a sudden, for some strange reason, the bottom drops out of it. They walk out the back door and then they get on YouTube and they get on uh, Facebook and all these other social media sites and they get on there and they're drinking and they're just carousing and they're acting like the devil itself. Now you know good and well that all that preaching they did is a joke because the preaching is how you live your life. You don't live some man that's, you don't live, you don't live with it. You don't listen to a hypocrite, do you? Well, of course not. So what you're thankful for? Are you thankful? I never deserve what God's done for me. And I don't. But I am thankful. And one of the things that God judges people, He says, of this generation, unthankful. 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 And then finally, His trustworthiness. Your word marks your calendar. The responsibility you accept marks your calendar. Who you fear marks your calendar. What you're thankful for marks your, your cat, what I say, calendar, your character. And then finally, your trustworthiness is a true mark of your character. Trustworthy. Can they trust you? Can they trust you with money? Can they trust you with getting a job done? Can they trust you? Are you, are you what you appear to be? Do you, what you see is what you get? Have you learned how to put on the dog in church? It's not hard. Come long enough and you can listen to all the cliches and all the talk and all of that and you could go home one day and get in front of the mirror and practice it and come to church and everybody think you're a super saint. Amen. I told you about the girl there that I liked back in the Salvation Army that time. I've told you two or three times. I was as sorry and low down as I could be, and, but I liked her. And she was in the Salvation Army church. I went in there and I sat down. To my dismay, they got up and started testifying. I thought, good night, man. They're going to come to me. I did. They did. <laughs> but I listened to those testimonies, and I put me a good one together. <laughs> I did. I compiled me a good testimony. And then when they got to me, buddy, I stood up, and I gave out my test. I had a testimony and a half. You wouldn't believe it. I mean, I had a good testimony. But I didn't a bit more know the Lord than a man in the moon. But that's what you can do. You can learn all the talk. Cross all the T's, dot all the I's. And I hope you're not that tonight. I hope you're real. For your own good, I hope you're real. Your trustworthiness. Number one is a teacher. Commit thou to faithful men should be able to teach others also. Teaching is a sacred trust. Teaching is important, folks. So many people put the emphasis on preaching, and I'm, for, I'm there, I'm a preacher. And we need preaching. But we also need teaching. And there's a difference between the two. Uh, uh, preaching puts a, puts a kind of a, a command, a demand, a, a burden, a challenge on you. But teaching is exposing the Scripture. It opens up the Word of God. See, and you need to be taught. Uh, teaching. Have you been given a responsibility to teach? We'll say, well, I just teach little kids. Are you kidding? The little children are vulnerable. They're, they're at that moment where their mind is being shaped. That's very important. Never had figured out how a person can have a class full of little kids like that teaching them, then just get up and walk out the door. And I've got to figure that one out. Never did make any sense to me because that's a good job. That's a responsibility. That's a big responsibility to teach others also. Uh, we've got a lot of leaders. You remember when Paul was locked up over there in jail? He was locked up, and the Bible said, 
He said, some men preach Christ in pretense and some in truth, supposing to add affliction to my bonds. He said, whether in pretense or truth, Christ is preached. What Paul was saying, number one, it wasn't about him. Paul said, it didn't matter about me. I must decrease and he must increase. Who said that? Remember them saying that in the New Testament? Who? Exactly. You know, why don't you? They came to John and said, they're baptizing more people over here than they are for you. And John said, that's fine. <laughs> That's fine. What do you think I'm here for? I must decrease. He must increase. It's not about me. It's not about super saints. It's about that issue of leadership. You can go to school and be taught how to organize. You can go to school and learn how to, you know, how to, how to, how to, how to structure a church and all of that stuff. But that does not make you a leader. It does not make you a leader. Leadership comes from the Holy Ghost. That's the gift of God. All are not leaders. But your trustworthiness, which way you lead them? Which way? As long as I'm alive by the grace of God, and it's only by the grace of God, I pray that I'll lead in Jesus' name and never falter and never deviate and never apostatize and never turn away from my own good. I pray that until the day I die and the last breath I take in this body that I'll stand for the truth and lead the right way. That's important to me. That's important to me. So uh, when I was a kid, they used to say this all the time. Well, he can't hold down a job. How many ever heard that term? See, the younger generation hadn't heard much of that. But when I was a kid, that was a big deal. Hold down a job. So what do you mean hold it down? Do it. Because there's somebody waiting in line for your job. And if you don't do that job, their boss is going to give it to somebody else. That means you have to be trustworthy. You have to be proficient. You have to be uh, constant. You have to be there. And that's a good mark of your character, to be able to hold down a job. I was reading, doing a little research into a, a little town up in West Virginia called Welch, West Virginia. How many ever heard of it? Most folks haven't. It's just a little, little town up there, coal mining people, hardworking people, hardworking people. But Welch, along with many other communities in our country, has suffered a lot financially. Financially. The poverty level is astronomical. Astronomical. And, and, and the average income is a little about $20,000, $25,000 a year. It's pitiful. You know, but these coal miners, the coal miners will go back into that coal mine and sometimes at the hazard of their life. And they'll work. You know, I told you about the, the coal the the, uh, the the problem up here in Coalfield at that time it was called uh, you, where, the, where it collapsed and these coal miners wrote their wrote their notes to their loved ones and they found them on their bodies uh, I can't think of the name of it uh, Freighterville Freighterville it was the Freighterville uh, mine disaster and you can go up to that town it's up around uh, uh, Lake City uh, some like to call it Rocky Top. Uh, Rocky Top's over here. Lake City's back up here. And uh, they, uh, they've got a church up there, I think, or a monument or something. It's got the names of the men and the people on it that died. And the, and the message they left for their loved ones, for their families, their wives, their children. It's a wonderful thing. Touch your heart. If nothing does, it does. And it's remarkable. But you see, they go in there, they crawl back into that mine, and they work all day long. Okay? All right, we have a foolish, stupid politician who gets up in front of this nation and says, I'll destroy the coal industry. And he just about did. He just about did. I marvel how that one man has the power to go in there and destroy the livelihood in the homes. Now these, these folk, the, uh, the drug addiction is off, off the chart. Churches have closed down. All... They say that, uh, I think it was, uh, what did I read? Something like 50 to 70% of the homes are abandoned. Nobody will buy them because nobody has a job. So you've got all this abandoned property sitting around. Horrible what's been done to these people. They didn't ask for that. You know what happened to the coal industry? Back in the, back in the 50s and 60s, the coal industry was booming in this country. Detroit, Michigan was building cars. It was manufacturing all over the country. 
And coal was one of the sources to, of the fuel for the manufacturing, okay? So Welch, West Virginia, and many places like that grew and boom, it's a boom town because they were pulling this out of the ground. And, but now, uh, globalism moved in. Globalism. I'm going to ask you a question. Didn't plan to get on this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Who do you think got rich off of globalism? You know this crowd that gets up and likes to talk about the middleman, the working man, middle income, you know, I'm for the working man. Well, if you voted for NAFTA, you're not a man, you're not for the working man. Ross Perot said you'll hear a giant sucking sound from the jobs that went south and went overseas. Yeah, they did. They're not for you. They don't care anything about you. They're making money hand over fist by foreign investments. Money makes money. And these people are multi-billionaires while you pay the price for it. Globalism. I don't care anything about you. But you know, you get up and you go on and you work. Sometimes you go to work and you're sick as a dog, but you still go to work. You go to work. You may get up and go to work, and when you're tired, you may get up and go to work and you don't want to. But you have to go to work. Why do you go to work? Because you want to hold down a job. You want to pay your bills. You want to feed your family, pay your mortgage, uh, your car payment, whatever, it's insurance, whatever, you know, whatever you got. You want to pay your bills. That's a mark of character. I have a whole lot more respect for a man that takes on the responsibility of paying his bills than I do some swami that abandons his family and runs off out here into never, never land and saying God has sent him on some kind of a great spiritual uh, odyssey while his family sits at home hungry. Don't tell me that. That's garbage. That's junk. The Bible said if a man won't feed his family, he's done what? He's worse than a infidel. He's denied the faith. Yes, he has. And time's plagues unfold. Dreams, hollow streets, the silence screams.